Good evening and a very warm, warm welcome to this third program in the patient education series of the MS Center at Thomas Jefferson University. A series that as this one would not be possible without the generous support of sponsors. And here you see the platinum as well as the gold sponsors of the program series. Their support is acknowledged. So neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder and MOSD. What causes it and who is at risk? Let us discuss and review some of the points uh, that this title raises. When we think about multiple sclerosis, we think uh, in part of uh, conditions that affect individuals at more temperate climates, Europe, uh, Australia, the South, uh, New Zealand, um, but perhaps less uh, the tropics or the tropical areas. We know now that in, in uh, multiple sclerosis, there is an involvement also of populations that live in temperate climate that perhaps originally wouldn't have been considered as the prime uh, target population for the disease, such as African Americans or migrants from areas of low uh, MS to areas of high MS. Neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder is a little bit different from that. As you see from this map, it happens to occur all over the world. In fact, uh, persons of Asian extraction, persons of African extraction are at a higher risk uh, to develop neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders and Caucasian individuals. So the rate ranges around the globe. Here in the United States, uh, for Caucasian Americans, the risk is probably somewhere around one in a hundred thousand per uh, versus in African Americans, the risk is probably somewhere around 10 in a hundred thousand. What's also very interesting is the fact that NMO is essentially a condition that affects, affects predominantly women. Nine out of 10 patients are women. And you see uh, on the top that these nine out of 10 uh, rule holds up essentially uh, for any uh, ethnicities that we will be looking at. You also see over here again, the numbers that I quoted before, about one in a hundred thousand in the Caucasian population, up to 10 in a hundred thousand in the African-American population. When does MS start? When we look at the different populations, it appears that both in Asians and in Blacks, neuromyelitis optica disorder starts earlier than in Whites. In multiple sclerosis, we normally say that about one in six patients or so has a family member with uh, multiple sclerosis. This is number is much lower in uh, the general population for neuromyelitis optica, uh, where the a priori risk is about three to five percent. However, in families with very strong autoimmune histories, the risk for uh, having a relative with neuromyelitis optica goes up. So what this means is that neuromyelitis optica holds 
company with other autoimmune diseases. For many, many years, neuromyelitis optica was essentially viewed as a subform of multiple sclerosis. More recently, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, neuromyelitis optica has come in its own right as an, its own disease condition. And this splitting of uh, multiple sclerosis was possible because of a discovery that in neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, many individuals have a certain antibody, have a certain marker in the uh, serum, in the blood. In 2002, researchers at the Mayo Clinic found that if one looks in neuromyelitis optica, uh, that there are the serum binds certain areas in the tissue if they were staining uh, tissue in histopathology. Two years later, also a researcher at the Mayo Clinic reported that this staining, that these uh, antibodies bind a certain surface feature on cells within the brain. And what these antibodies were binding was recognized as a water channel, as a channel that regulates how cells in the tissue take up water or how they regulate how much water comes in and how much water goes out. Think of this almost like as a lock on a channel where essentially the water flow is controlled. Let us look at what aquaporin 4 is. Aqua stands for water. Porin stands for a pore, for a hole. And you see over here, uh, if I may remind you to your high school uh, biology, you see the lipid membrane, and in the middle you see the drum, and that's the aquaporin and through which the water can flow. But as with a lock uh, on a channel, <clears throat> water can only flow when the water channel allows it. So this is the regulatory system that allows this. Now, as you see over here, obviously when there's something has the name aquaporin four, you can imagine there is an aquaporin one and there are other uh, aquaporin other such water channels. What is specific or special about the aquaporin four is that it's expressed on foot processes of cells within the brain, namely the astrocytes. Astrocytes are kind of the conveyors of nutrition to cells within the brain. They take up the nutrition from the uh, capillaries, take it up and then uh, transport it to the other cells in the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes, the cells that make the myelin, and the neurons, that sell the cells that are the thinking part, the operating part of the brain. Here you see this supply chain. We have all thought a lot about supply chains in the last year, where uh, nut uh, nutrients, oxygen is taken up by the astrocytes, transported to the neurons, and also given to the oligodendrocytes. And you can obviously imagine that if there were a damage to this supply chain, uh, that would 
deprive the nerve cells that are very dependent on nutrients and energy, that this would uh, lead to injury of their capacity to function normally. What is interesting about aquaporin-4 is that it's expressed in larger uh, density in different parts of the brain. And you see this over here. You see, for example, uh, that it is expressed at the surface of the brain, in certain deep structures of the brain. That's the uh, lower uh, panels. And then on the left hand, in the lower panel, you see the spinal cord, where also uh, the aquaporin-4 is expressed. So why do we discuss where aquaporin-4 is expressed in greater detail? Well, we, express, uh, we discuss this because in neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, wherever the aquaporin-4 is expressed in large density, that's where the antibody, the anti-aquaporin-4 antibody can bind to these water channels and then initiate an inflammatory response. But more about this later. So in the brain, aquaporin-4 is expressed in different parts of the brain. And what this causes is that when antibodies bind and when antibodies, uh, uh, the aquaporin-4 antibodies initiate inflammation initiate an inflammatory response. Uh, we see damage, or we see uh, inflammation in very specific areas. And you see this uh, indicated over here. You can, for example, have optic neuritis, where you see the top panel, the inflation in the optic nerves. We have a lot of water channel expressed in the spinal cord that can lead to inflammation of the spinal cord. We call this transverse myelitis. And since uh, the involvement with neuromyelitis optica is extensive, meaning over several stretches of the spinal cord, we call this longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And at the bottom, you see that Aquaporin-4 is also expressed in other parts. And when uh, there is inflammation because the antibody, the aquaporin-4 antibody binds, there are other specific syndromes that can manifest, not just optic neuritis or transverse myelitis. This is in contrast to multiple sclerosis, where uh, the lesion have a different distribution because uh, in uh, multiple sclerosis, lesions happen around small blood vessels. They happen mostly in the white matter. Obviously, there are also gray matter lesions. And so when we, as specialists, look at the brain, we see uh, different distributions of the lesions in neuromyelitis optica and in multiple sclerosis. Obviously, these are relative differences and additional studies are very often needed to better understand this. So I discussed with you that there are areas of the brain where there is a lot of aquaporin-4 expressed. And that's then the area where inflammation can occur. In the first picture here, you see that a lot of aquaporin-4 is expressed in the spinal cord, that's in the red circle. And we know from a study of where aquaporin-4 is expressed that that's an area where there is a lot of uh, aquaporin-4 present. We can have uh, other areas involved around the fluid-filled cavities, the ventricles, 
you see this in the second picture over here. There are also what we call uh, other fluid, normally fluid filled areas, the aqueduct uh, that you see over here, uh, the force ventricle uh, with inflammation surrounding it. Right around uh, the, uh, this area, there is the thalamus, a very important area uh, because it's a relay, a relay station for many neurologic functions. And it can obviously also affect the areas uh, lower down in the brain. Here, it's in the uh, part where, uh, for example, hiccup can be controlled. And so one form of neuromyelitis optica, individuals can have chronic hiccup. We call this the area, the area postrema, the syndrome. And naturally, as already shown in the beginning, there can also be significant involvement of the spinal cord. Now, when you look at this, What's all common to these findings is the fact that in these areas, aquaporin-4 is richly expressed on astrocytes, and it's then this acquired antibody, the anti-aquaporin-4 antibody that binds and leads to an inflammatory response in these areas. The interesting thing about aquaporin-4 is that it's an antibody that is testable, that can be tested. And with that, uh, for many patients, when we can show that there is the aquaporin-4 antibody present, this becomes an important diagnostic biomarker. Whenever we have a diagnostic biomarker, it's very important to think about how we test this. And at this point in time, the favorite, the best available tests are cell-based assays. So where cells uh, are expressing anti uh, expressing aquaporin-4 and then the antibody, the serum from patients is exposed. And with that one can check whether or not there are antibodies in a patient serum that uh, bind to the aquaporin-4. There are other technologies. Uh, they are uh, less sensitive, as you see in the right-hand panel. The most sensitive one are the uh, wholesale assays. Obviously, wholesale assay means uh, more technology and not in the US, but in other certain other countries, it may be more difficult to have the cell-based assays, but here in the US at this point in time, best available technology means a cell-based assay. And that's in a way important to understand if one has an animal test. And for example, individuals that were tested for animal uh, in 2005, 2006, 2007, may not have had a cell-based assay. So it's not inappropriate to retest an individual after uh, uh, several years to see whether, uh, in fact, they were animal antibody negative. Because aquaporin-4 is an antibody, Things that we do when we treat a person with acute neuromyelitis aquatica, with an acute attack, particularly at the time of the first attack, when we don't yet know that the person has neuromyelitis optica, uh, things that we do as part of the treatment can potentially render the test less sensitive and makes it necessary that we retest the patient later on. Some of the patients that have neuromyelitis optica and have an attack get plasma exchange. During the plasma exchange, antibodies are sucked out of the, the blood, out of the serum. And obviously, this will lead to a lowering of the antibodies that are left behind. 
this can lead to an abnormally low acropor anti acroporin 4 level. And so if somebody had plex plasma exchange uh, and a serum sample was not retained from before plasma exchange, one needs to retest after several months. Sometimes individuals with an NMO attack or a first attack are also treated with IVIG. IVIG is antibodies from many, many people that have been purified and sterilized, and then high doses of such antibodies are given on a person. Well, that could mean that the own antibodies that the person had are very diluted out, or it could also mean that perhaps somebody else in the pool of patients that uh, allow preparation of a IDIG preparation may have had antibodies. And so again, one needs to wait until these foreign antibodies are cleared from the person a time, uh, some things that can take some time. Even with best technology, about 10 to 40% of patients that we clinically think have neuromyelitis optica remain antibody, anti aquaporin 4 antibody positive negative. And that is important because as we learned when neuromyelitis optica split off multiple sclerosis, it is also possible, and I will show you one example, that the individuals that have a condition that looks like neuromyelitis optica but don't have the antibody may actually have another condition. So when we look at the patients that have neuromyelitis optica, there are the ones that are antibody positive and the ones that are antibody negative. As I mentioned, about uh, 60 to 90% of persons with, uh, are positive when we think that they have an MOSD. About 30% of patients or, or is it, uh, are NMO antibody negative. Among them, many have another antibody that's called MOG, and I will discuss this in the later part of our conversation tonight. It is a different condition, but has also been subsumized under NMOSD. Uh, at this point in time, we also refer to this as MOG disease. Why is this important? Because, as I mentioned, the aquaporin-4 antibody binds aquaporin-4 expressed on astrocytes. In patients with MOG disease, there is an antibody present that recognizes a different feature on a different cell population within the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. These antibodies recognize MOG, myelin, oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, a mouthful, uh, myelin, so this is uh, interacting with the myelin or expressed on nerves, uh, expressed or wrapping nerve cells, and this myelin is produced by the oligodendrocytes, the cells that produce the myelin. So in MOG disease, the target is the oligodendrocytes. In aquaporin-4 positive NMOSD, the target is the oligodendrocytes. So very important. And with that, there are obviously additional cell populations that could be discovered in the patients that are both MOG and aquaporin-4 antibody negative. I think it is important to recognize how exciting this is, how uh, technology really has helped us identify these uh, 
disease conditions that before were hidden in plain sight from us. How does NMOSD present in different ethnic groups? Well, in whites, uh, optic neuritis is more frequent and involvement of the spinal cord and the brainstem uh, is a little bit less uh, frequent at the initial presentation. It is also important to note that while NMOSD in general is a much more severe disease than MS, Blacks and Asians have a higher likelihood of having severe attacks. And as I have already mentioned before, uh, in Blacks and Asians, uh, the disease can start earlier and uh, individuals can have a higher number of attacks. And we will come back to that in a little bit, what this means diagnostically. So how, what are the current characteristics? How do we diagnose neuromyelitis optica? Well, there are uh, diagnostic uh, criteria, which we will review with each other. But let me take uh, a quick break over here and uh, discuss with you biomarkers, because I have mentioned that word now several times. And if we think about uh, what the NMO uh, antibody, the anti-aquaporin-4 antibody is, or for that matter, the MOG antibody, these are diagnostic biomarkers. To a certain degree, the aquaporin-4 antibody is also a prospective or uh, a predictive antibody because individuals that are aquaporin-4 positive have a relatively high rate of repeat attacks. So having aquaporin-4, having NMOSD would uh, mark the person as having a higher risk for return of disease activity for the next attack. Why is this important? Because it helps us obviously particularly as we have treatments available at this point in time, it helps us to uh, really risk stratify and ensure that individuals have rapid access to treatment. But you see over here that there are many different antibodies uh, or anti biomarkers that we would like to have. I, for example, would like to have a biomarker that a priori knows whether somebody is going to have uh, neuromyelitis optica, we don't have that. I would like to have an antibody or a marker to tell me whether somebody is at high risk or at low risk for frequent attacks. We don't have that at this point in time. As I mentioned in aquaporin-4, if one somebody is aquaporin-4 positive, then the antibody, then that indicates that this person has a higher likelihood of, of the next attack but it doesn't tell me when this attack in that particular person would occur. 